I was here. Let's give them a few round of applause this morning. Yeah, we sure appreciate you uh, up in the sound, call upon you, and step right up. And I always had encouraging words for us, and share about our history, things that we need to know, our mind, and how to how to express that, how to conduct ourselves. So appreciate you being here. I am. I have to come here today with a heavy heart. I got word uh, first thing this morning. My niece had passed away. I had a twin brother. His name was Ted Lee. He was a good singer. He sang for a verse, sent it to man, ceremony, power. And uh, it's the daughter. Yes, I can do my two brothers. But you feel things when you have a twin that other people don't feel. And so I, I kind of hesitated. I said, well, maybe I'm supposed to stay out of public. Or, but I want to come to support you all. Especially my brother, Mr. China, because I know how long he's been working on this. I know I've seen him all. He used to work for the tribe. He worked for the tribe for several years trying to bring about this very thing here. But he's not new to the field, or he's a person like Yuka Kana. You know that he's sincere because he started with nothing. And he found some friends, they found some relatives, and they found some good people that's willing to help, that need this help, that understand what it means to be in the streets, what it means to be in the back alleys of the city, what it means to be on the res, no job, no future. And so he tried to bring those experiences uh, to help people. So for that, I said, well, I've got to support my little brother, man, because he's doing something that we haven't seen in the City for a long, long, long time. I remember how I got a involved with this movement of the right. I had a friend uh, who had a movement chapter in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he brought a, a, a request to Ames. He said, you guys want to be leaders? You want to be representatives of the issues of Indian country? You want to speak for the people? We should do a so. Was at that time, this was uh, 1968, and this movement was just getting started. Movement to be able to use our ceremonies and our ways to try to help us. So he was one of the early ones. His name was Drew Collins. Don't be shy to remember. He had a and uh, they started over that way. I know we had it over here too, in Rapid City and other places, and we meant to use our ceremony, but it took all this time in life to have the non Indian community, the medical community, the treatment community to take it seriously. You see the result of what happens when you're hit with you. Use your own ways. Use what, what was given to us by the Creator. And uh, AA is good. A lot of people have uh, used that to take care of their families, to sober up. But this way here of uh, using our ceremonial ways is uh, 
not do. But yet, it started to be recognized after all these years. And it's programs like this that continue to build that reputation, that character for people And uh, so my idea was to come um, to give you some history of these treaties of human rights self-determination. I think the most important part is like Mr. Starr comes out. You try to do is what they call self-determination, which means that we do for ourselves. So that's why this program is so important. It epitomizes or it is the best example of self-determination. We help our own. We help our people in the traditional ways of our ancestors. And we have different tribes, different languages, but if we could use those, then that makes a lot of difference. But I heard other speakers talk about boarding school, military. I experienced all those. And uh, so I wanted to be able to come to talk a little bit about the larger world because we have what's called the indigenous people. That's the Indian people around the world. They still know their language. They still have their ceremonial ways. They still have their territory. So their reservation, whether in the jungle, whether they're in some islands, they all have their ways. I my travels. But I had some good teachers. But I started out, I didn't know nothing. United Nations, there was a whole different world. I was raised around, I lived in the Rosebud area. And so I never experienced the outside world other than the army. And uh, I went to Vietnam, that's a whole other world there. But anyway, I wanted to learn. <laughs> And um, well, I went to Latvia State. I met different people up there. And I had this uh, elder. He wasn't even sober. He gave me a book that maybe all of you know about. If you don't, at least you maybe you can buy it down here at the it's called Mary Mahana Unity. It's the history of our Indian people here in North America. What do we face? All of the policies of the government is brutal, but it's the truth. And so every non Indian, every white child should experience that book or at least part of it so they know what we went through. And then our families also. You know why we're still here? I was strong. I we maintain our real life. Let's do that book. You can hear about all the things from the gang, our people, and pale ministry too. It's almost 38. And the history of the whole country. Poland. But they defend them because they had a treaty with the United States government. And so we can do pity for pity for all these great chiefs that we have. They talk. Because when I was going to the United Nations, I went to see Fulcro, who was our leader uh, and wanted me at that time in the Black Hills. And uh, Fulcro. He told me, he said, you know, we had a United Nations in one time as uh, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. It's called Pipestone. And so he said, we used to gather there, not every year or every month or anything, but every now and then when we had a need, when we, we had to face this, this uh, 
policies that the government is basically arming to, to get ready to prepare us. Uh, and we went over there and we had we stayed there for a week or two and have meetings about how we're going to defend our land because we heard about what happened in Minnesota. And if we don't make a good stand like they did over there, they're going to start hanging us out here like they did over there. So we have to get our, our families together. And I found out just like the family of us in this building, when we fight as families, no, we can't defeat them. Whether it's fighting against alcohol, drugs, if we do it as a family, Uh, and so Fusco told me that story. He said, when you go over there, he said, use that treaty. He said, we're going to send it to the United Nations. And when you get there, stick that treaty in the door. Of course, he meant that, uh, you know, in the way of a uh, story, he said, stick it in the door because that proves that we're an because treaty they're signed nation to nation. They're not signed by main organizations or tribes or, or uh, labor unions or they're signed between nations. So we put that in there and that's going to be your, your open the door for you. So it took us three years. We went 1974 and 1977 we got recognized. Well, we had our we got it used by the tourists, for the tourist film. But after the, we got our recognition in 1977, we walked in. We had a badge, just like the government of the world. And we walked in there and we could, we could meet other people, other struggles around the world that were fighting for the liberation of or to. There's a lot of governments like England, the United States, uh, in France, Germany, all the big countries, they all had colonies, they call them. They all had territory they took over because the Catholic Church told them that was, they had the right to do that to what they call the papal bull. But you don't hear that. When you go to church at Holy Rosary or maybe down to St. Francis, they don't tell you that history. Just like the Americans, they don't tell us the history of the United States when we went to school. We have to learn it on our own, or through our family. And so food school taught me a great lesson. You know, and I remember in one of the uh, they told us to give up our arms, to, to uh, stop fighting. And we lost three people there. We lost uh, Buddy Lamont. He was killed there. Another man by the name of Frank Clearwater. And one of the, my great friends, the history of our, our movement, his name was Peter Ovis Smith. He was head of the Obama City Civil Rights Organization, which asked us, us to be other Obamas who belong to the American Indian movement. He asked us to come there because they didn't have no rights to Pine Ridge. They were using uh, scare tactics. They used their own police force. Police force was made up of friends of the tribal government. And they would send them on people that was against some of the policies of the tribe. And so it got, got violent. Because remember, these were different times in the 60s, 70s. Everybody was protesting, all races, whether it was the uh, Hasakas, the, uh, the African Americans, you know, the Chicanos. Uh, they all had to fight for their rights. And so as Indian people, we were joined in that. We met a lot of those people. But uh, 
So Kushka, when he came inside Buddha Deha, we admired him so much. He didn't tell us to lay down your arms, let the BIA take over. Uh, let's give up. He said, basically, when he was leaving, he talked to everybody. We had a negotiating committee. He said, for each here, to, to be brave. That's what he told him. He didn't say give up. He didn't say let out in the arms. He said, for each here, that was his word of encouragement. Be free. But he knew we had a battle. So that's how we lost those people. But he also came in and uh, we lost those people, Pedro and, and uh, Buddy and Frank Gilroy. He came in and he said, that's enough. He said, you young people, you take what you learned here in Wounded D and you take it home. Whether it's the sweat lodge, but them days they didn't have too many sweat lodges around the country, 1970s. Maybe a few, but they were traditional people who kind of kept it over here on the side. Sometimes they had to get permission from Father Stanis over at Holy Rosary to have a sweat or to have a sundown. He used to run the sundown. At Pine Ridge. Some of you might remember that. He gave the whole cave good pierce. You could only put a safety pin in your shirt, dance with the tree. Because Father Steinman said that's the way it has to be. You can't go back to the original. But nowadays, you're going to hear from Mr. G Dog later. He's going to tell you about. Some of those things that we had to struggle for. I remember during the time they asked Crudog to come to the wounded knee to start a sun dance. So they brought a tree in here. Everybody is getting ready to put up the tree. Here the police came. The tribal judge, chief judge, he sent out the cops. They arrested Crudog. They even arrested the tree. They took the tree and sent it outside the jail at Pine Ridge. And finally the people got together and they went and said, you don't have no reason to arrest Krona. We asked him to come here. And so we loaded the tree on the top of the old car and we hauled it back towards the coast. But all that time, Scroll, Matthew King, they all came there. And uh, so that's how I learned about we have to, like this program here, we've got to fight for the recognition. By fighting, I mean, we have to have success. We've got to show them that it works in order for them to believe. Because the white man believes with some reason that if you write, write something down, on a paper, a piece of paper, black and white. If you put it in black and white, it inherently has more truth to it. And so with that, that's why we've always got to prove that these programs work. Self-determination. The other one I'm going to talk about is human rights. Human rights is something that is around the whole world. Human rights, the idea and the definition and the movement for human rights around the world started by a lady. A group of women got together. She was the wife of President Roosevelt. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was her name. She fought, she told, introduced in the United Nations only started in 1946. So she introduced the idea of human rights which means that everybody has basic rights that are inherent, that you're born with. No government can give you human rights, only to question. Oh, these are basic rights that we all have. And so that's why they have a declaration of human rights at the United Nations. 
to show people in black and white in written form what human rights is, the basic rights of all people to be who they are. That's the main thing because that colonialism of these churches, they're the ones that what they call pacification truth. That's what I was involved with in Vietnam. I've seen it how it operated. I realized that that's what they use the army for. They go in and they fight you militarily, and then they bring in the pacification truth. That's the priest. That's the church. Not because they're bad people, but because their mission, their job is to convert. To take away your language, like we all heard about. You couldn't speak Indian when you went to boarding school. No, you couldn't have power like you have now. You couldn't have these things associated with education. They all had to be done in secret or an annual power thing. Obama Nation. Power and Rodeo. That's the only way we got to have a traditional way we had to have a priest. Okay. Or, but uh, human rights are something that all people have a right to. So that's why we passed, took us 30 years at the United Nations working with indigenous people all over the world that said we have basic rights. So we put it in writing. It's called the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And if you get a chance, go on our website. It's called treatycouncil.org. And you can look on there, you'll see that document on there. You'll see other documents that we presented to the United States government during our time going on various marches, occupation things like that. We had to get the attention of the world, and we did so. And we hooked up. Now it started as a real movement of one city civil rights organization. American Indian movement started a little movement around this part of the country. It's now a worldwide movement for human rights. So whether you live in the jungle of the Amazon, they call it, the Indian people down there call that the lungs of Mother Earth because there's so much green, it cleanses the air of Mother Earth. And as they chop down the trees for these lumber companies to make these beautiful houses along these lakes and up in the Black Hills, they're chopping down the air we breathe. They're chopping down the filter the jungle. That's why we have climate change. And because all this started with indigenous people's resources. Remember when they came here, what they discovered the Amazon? Gold. They have a saying that they say in a quota, they say the white man has a disease. The gold makes them crazy. So that's why they took the Black Hills. 1877, they used an illegal act of Congress to take the gold here in the Black Hills. And once they smelled and once they seen that gold, they wouldn't leave it. Now we have about we have a conference down there, a treaty conference. They give us an update. Last year, when they reported there was 55 permits for gold mine in the Black Hills. But they don't mine it like they used to, where they go underground. They strip mine it. They come and take all the trees, they take everything, gravel, everything, and then they, they might find an ounce of gold. But an ounce of gold is worth over well, maybe $200, $500 sometimes. But I just wanted to say that we that's our Black Hills belong. You know that. That's where we were created as a nation out of Wind Cave. You 
know our creation story, they point to the Black Hills, the Lakota elders, medicine man, they call it the heart of everything that is. That's what the Black Hills is. Spiritually, and now after the white man found the minerals, even to them, it's a special place, but it's a special place for materialism. Whereas Indian people, it's a special place for ceremony, special place to pray, special place to have amblesia. So these are things that we understand but we have to fight for our human rights. We have to do it through self-determination, meaning that we have to do it. Nobody's gonna come, the BIA is not gonna come and say, here's your black hills. We're gonna give it back to you. They're on the other side. It's us, people. But slowly we're making a dent because other people are beginning to understand human rights as a global, standards and now we have Indian operating at the United Nations we begin to make a dent into their thinking that we have a right to our self-determination we have a right to human rights we have a right to our treaty territories you made a agreement you made a contract with us now you'll never be an honorable government until you honor the treaty you made with us American Indian. So these are the things that we bring up in these meetings. The treaty, don't say they're an old document. Don't say they're not important anymore. We've got to teach our children about that. So we keep this movement going because it says right in there, black and white, and it's a guy you see. And we own that. So little by little, we've got to pay smile up there now sacred site as part of our creation story. And so now the tribe got together, they bought some of our land back. And we got criticized a lot. The tribe got together the Mystic Lake, some of these tribes that have a lot of money from gaming. They chipped in. They came and they looked at the black hills. They felt that power. They felt that meaning of what it means the creation and the wind came. They felt that spiritual power and they, they dug in their pockets, they helped us. And our little tribes here are, we come to Mishika, but we have the blessing. We've got the ceremony of waves. So those other tribes out there, they understood it. This is a special place. So they helped us buy that sacred site that we have now. But we own that, 5,000 acres. In the black hills, we gotta, we gotta start. And eventually, you know, we we'll get the rest. The federal land belongs to us. We might let the Washita stay for the length of his lease, or stay until his, because you know, there, there are people that came to school here and grew up here. They see all these bright lights of the city. They don't want to live here no more. They find the children of these people in the black room. They're leaving. So there's a lot of land for sale. So before they tell us to some more white men, we got to get in there. And so that's what we did. We're organized so far to get a little bit back at a time. But we're also talking about leasing. We're talking about home management. But we can take a lot of the federal land in the black hills and manage it ourselves. Self determination. We don't need the white man to run all the national parks, all the forest service. They say now that the, they log so much timber on the black hills, they need to stop the logging. Stop the logging because it's not going to grow back anymore if they keep it up on the present rate. So these are things we work with every day. How are we going to take some of this back? How are we going to use it? Build a school there, build a treaty office right here in Rapid City. These are things that are in the near future. So that when this land comes up for sale, we get some of our friends together around the world and say, help us get this back. 
Uh, whatever means necessary. That's what Malcolm X used to say. He was a black leader. But that's what it means. We gotta outthink it. We gotta outpray. We gotta out ceremonial them to understand who we are, that we have the, both the spiritual power and the organizing power to get to the black hills there. So that's the reason why you guys are the represent the whole, you represent the grassroots that it takes to make this movement to return the Black Hills powerful and free and worldwide. So you all have a job to do to help us get that back, to return to, to the original owners, to return that land for our spiritual well-being, for our cultural ways, for our language. And so uh, I want to thank you because it's kind of been a tough day for our family. I got to go back now and console my, my nieces. There's three of them here. That's my brother's kids. Their sister died this morning. And so I'm not asking for no pity, but maybe if you pity and prayer is a lot different. So if you have it in your heart to remember our, our family, uh, remember send your prayers. I'll let you do The doctor, yeah. Yeah. Oh, They will go back to your brother, your means love and family member, and a gift for him. Thank you. Uh, those are some really good words that he had to say about sovereignty, because this is uh, our base in our, uh, hope, our organization on here, sovereignty. We're doing things that uh, need to be done to be effective for our own. And we got our own way, like I was mentioned, for the last the thousands and thousands of years. So we're reconnecting again to who we are. The winter solstice is coming up, so we're going to have a ceremony to that and reconnect, re-educate those that uh, do not know. Because what we do a lot in our program here, orientation, the fall hostess, the fall equinox, we all gather here at their feet. And the Chie Rictunos gave a good presentation on why we do this. Why we've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years at this spot. The star now is lined up at that area for a couple of days. And the prayers are really powerful in the energy there to be reconnecting us. And our ancestors are there. It was a good, awesome kind of presentation. You know, there was approximately 75, 80 of us there. We had a kind of big circle. He gave that presentation of why we do this. It was, it was way more intense than I can say. This is what we do. It's the home that the creation story comes from. We have our way too, you know, that has been forgotten. So we're bringing it back. I so appreciate Mr. Bill Wings here. He's a good. Uh, Real good uh, friend and uh, family member. My parents really respected him also, you know, my brothers. He's been part of us as we grew up. The one he mentioned, a big part of the movement and understanding who we are. So again, I want to thank you. For me, that our prayers will be this family for you three weeks today. We'll move on.
So what we'll do this going and then we'll take a little break for the thing. And then uh not out here All right, get your red tickets out. Pat Sajak has uh Vanna White down. I got Vanna Brown. Is it? <laughs> All right, our lovely assistant here. All right, red tickets, get your red tickets out. And the winning number is 9913878. And that will be Joseph Gardella. All right, Joseph, come on up here. This is a uh, brick from Doug Fast Horse. There you go. All right, you're a winner now. Show us up. All right, you want a speech. I'm just joking. Go ahead, listen to him. All right, let's give him a big round of applause. We have 25 items that are up there for a silent auction. So that means I'm going to auction it off, but I'm going to be really quiet. It is. But really, if I was the auctioneer, I got I got my own resume of auctioneer. I didn't hardly lose your money. All right, still in the crowd. Okay, all right now. Let's take a break and then come back in 10 minutes. That's 15 minutes of a lot of time. Let's take a break and then come on back.